So what's up? <laughs> I'm gonna start this off with. Um, I remember. I want to say it was about five years ago. I am behind the bar doing something with the bartender, and uh, we were talking. And this guy comes in, buys takeout, and walks out the door. I said, "That guy looks familiar. Who is it? Comes in here quite often." I said, "Well, he's an author or something." So. <laughs> I grip him up the next time I see him, and I, hey, how you doing? I'm PJ Dolan. He says, hey, I'm Joe Franz. And uh, I said, I heard you're an author. He goes, yeah, and he tells me his whole story. And I was actually reading Dream Seller at that time when uh, I formally introduced myself to him. Um, and, you know, always have been a, a fan of uh, the whole, uh, you know, Viva La Bam, Jackass, all that, and even more importantly, uh, Mr. Novak stints on the Howard Stern show, which really, I, I remember having to pull over the car because they were that funny. And um, come to, you know, years down the road, sitting across the table from you and having you guys stop by my bar and do a little shoot there, uh, it's, it's full circle for me, and it's really uh, a privilege and an honor to have you here. Um, welcome to Behind Bars. Thank you. I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm really excited about this as well. I'm a firm believer of, you know, in retrospect, life for me, and I believe most, is usually live forward and learn backwards. Mm. And, um, you know, having, having had this spiritual experience that I've had in my life as a direct result of of a 12-step fellowship that I attend on a daily basis, it's allowed me to do this like internal work that was required in order to get these external results that I've always desired. And with that being said, it's, 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 it's very clear to me, having done that work and remaining sober long enough, coming up on six years, to look back and recognize the synchronicity and life's events that have led us to the here and now, literally, you know, prove to me that, that, that I am not in charge of any of this. Um, I'm, I'm not running the show. I don't, I don't dictate the terms of the outcome. I simply know my role and my role is to, to, to be a messenger for what I believe is my God of my understanding mm -hmm. for what he sees fit. And, um, I don't believe in, in luck or coincidence. I believe everything is destiny and fate. And, you know, I, I, I don't see that as like a, a crazy, you know, by chance coincidental experience of you happening to read that book as, as, as Joe Franz comes in to get a six pack to go. And, you know, uh, even coming down to this here and now, I, I was reached out to by, uh, I believe, an attorney that we share. And, he reached out to me a while ago and he said, hey, I have this guy who owns a lot of bars in the Pennsylvania area. And um, ironically enough, he's he's like a sober guy too and he has this podcast. And, and uh, would you be interested in going on it? And I, I didn't have a chance to get back to him because it just, I, I did and he kind of responded, but it's always touch and go between him and I. Um, but that was months ago. And then fast forward to I see you at your bar. Franz and I are talking to you about this scene that we wanted to film and the extras that we needed and the shots we were looking for. And you said, hey, I have a buddy that has a podcast. And I responded, does your buddy own bars? And you said, yeah. And then we dug a little more deeper into it. And I said, um, I had met you the first time and I'd given you my card. Right. And, and I guess your buddy found himself in a position where he might've needed some help at some point. Right. And you handed the card to him. He utilized the number on the card and we're here now. Here we are. You know, yeah. that's, that's not by chance coincidental. Mm. So, so this, this wasn't, you know, this was planned yeah. long, long before I, I could conceive the idea of it. Yeah, awful lot of synchronicity there. Yeah, and yeah, so right. yeah, right. and if you have that awareness to sure. to kind of piece it together, you know, is it odd or is it God? And I I don't like to say the word <laughs> God because I think that can be a very discouraging sure, word to sure. a lot of people, and I understand that. 
and I, I'm not a fan of uh, organized religion I, or religion for that matter. I, I'm in the spirituality and, um, you know, so I, I just know that it's a power greater than myself and it's not me right. is what my God is. I don't know what's a fucking river. I don't know if it's a fucking <laughs> man or a woman or a right. fucking cat. I, who the fuck knows? It's not that deep to me. But yeah, so that's my long rant on a, a point that I maybe made, maybe didn't. I go down these weird <laughs> rabbit holes. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's so I, I'm, I'm. So with that being said, yes, I'm very excited to be here uh, because this, more so than others, is very apparent to me that there's a, a bigger thing going on here. Yeah. Right. And I, I think there's um there's a lot of things that we're going to touch on, you know, in this conversation that are going to be very relevant to a lot of people in this industry that 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 Joe and I um, both work in and and have businesses in. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, if you could get into a little bit of your biography. I, I read Dream Seller. It was an absolute page turner. And I read a lot of books. Like, I'm a, I'm a nerd that way. As you can see, I have clear contact on this paperback because this is what I do after I went through recovery. I do weird shit like this. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Totally. Um, if that's I, the weirdest of shit well, you're doing in recovery, you have it made. <laughs> well, you, you, go through, you go through that, you know, that... The vanity thing. It's just like if you go to prison, you know what I mean? The first thing you do, like everybody in prison is about, you know, it's about vanity, right? Sure. It's, you know, it, it, once you lose that, you have nothing left. Yeah. And and when you get clean and sober, uh, especially for the first time, which by the grace of God with me, that happened. Um, went into recovery, uh, into rehab one time. Um, it's amazing. I've had falls, but I mean, I live my life in a certain set of values now because of it, right? Sure. Um, but literally, vanity is a huge thing. I went through that. I did the, the whole shopaholic route. You know, that whole, every, it, all the cliches that happen, you know, once you go down that road. Coming up on six years, I was just accused of vanity out front of this very house by dear Joe Franz, who accused me of having my car as a, a status of symbol symbolism. Bro, you look good. <laughs> and that's coming on six years, and that happened 10 minutes ago. You look good, bro. <laughs> and you know what? what's crazy, too, when you, when you think about it, especially sitting in the rooms, you can always tell when somebody goes out because the color goes like that. Yeah. You know, you see it. You see the gray come out in their face. You know, like you can tell they went right back out. You yeah. Know, you can see it. It's fucking scary. Um, but if you wouldn't mind... For those of you who live in a cave who don't know who you are, could you go a little bit of your biography? Like Dream Seller, it was gritty. I'm, I'm about 75 pages into this. It's gritty as hell, and I like that. I like that. Just like I like recovery rooms that are like that. You know sure. what I mean? Um, if you wouldn't mind going into your biography and a little bit of what it was like growing up, what your um, your skill set was, mm -hmm. and what was taken away from you as a result of addiction, yeah. and uh, we'll, we'll tie it all back into uh, the hospitality business. I'll give you a, a, a very Reader's Digest version of a 24-year, very long, you know, story with lots of peaks and valleys, okay. um, the best that I can. And, and what that looks like is I um, was born and raised in uh, Baltimore uh, by a loving family. If you caught me in early sobriety and asked me what my, my childhood was like or my upbringing was, I would have said to you it was the most debilitating, the most debilitating thing that, that any child should ever have to, to endure and no one should have that in their life. But again, now where I'm at and the work that I've done to get where I'm at and, and my, the perspective that I have, that's not the case. The, the reality is I, I, I came from a family that loved me the best that they could and did the best that they could with what they had. And what that looked like is my mother, um, was a nuclear physicist at, at Mercy Hospital. Retired after 53 years of gainful employment, second longest employer in Mercy Hospital history. Wow. Uh, my brother wanted to be an attorney his whole life. By the time he passed the bar, he graduated law school. He was literally blinded in student debt. Today currently resides as an attorney in the White House practicing pensions and benefits. My father never had a job a day in his life. He taught me one thing, if and when I go to prison, how to conduct myself. Uh, Ran with the Hells Angels, rather unsavory kind of fellow, if you will. Uh, today, no longer is with us. He succumbed to his addiction. His body shut down as a direct result of addiction and alcoholism. Uh, me, on the other hand, I got my first skateboard at the age of seven. And, and the night that my mother put me to bed, she said, Brandon, what would you like me to do with your skateboard? And I said, I want it in bed with me. And she said, why? And I said, because if I die, I want it to go with me. Right? It was the moment that that board had touched my hand. I knew I was gonna be a professional skateboarder. It was kind of like the Holy Grail being handed to me by Jesus himself, you know? Um, so th there was no reason to focus on a plan B, a trait, or an option. It did not matter. I was going to be a professional skateboarder. 
I ate it, I breathed it, I slept it, I dreamt it. At the age of 15, I was designing my pro model for Pal Peralta. Um, I was touring the world with Tony Hawk. Uh, I, I was, at the age of 14, I, I was sponsored by Gatorade, the first, uh, first ever skateboarder to be endorsed by Gatorade at that age. Um, they, they, they flew me out to Chicago to the Quake Roads building where they made Gatorade at the time. And, and, and they took us into this park and they picked these extreme athletes from different divisions. So they, they got a, a BMX uh, biker. It's not an extreme sport, but a volleyball player, a, uh, a skateboarder. And I, I forget the other ones, but I remember those two on myself. And, we're in the park and they bring Michael Jordan in and, and you know, we do this like commercial and the news is there. And so from a very young age, I'm doing some things in life that people would equate to success or happiness. Some potentially even dream of doing. Um, so for that matter, I, I can't tell you about the first time that I picked up the drink or the drug, right? Like it wasn't like I, I had sniffed that line, shot that bag, hit that pipe, swallowed that pill down that bottle and, and had that aha moment where I said, you know, I have now found the reason for which I will wake up and jump out of bed every morning with the lust of life like that. Th th that wasn't my story. I don't, I don't even remember the first time that I, I partook in, in, in a drink or a drug because the reality is skateboarding did for me at a very young age what drugs and alcohol did for me at a very later age, mm. right? Like you give me that skateboard at the age of seven and you put me in a room with the world's prettiest models. I, I'll not only believe that they've been waiting for me, but that they're dying to marry me. Skateboarding produced that, I mean, drugs and alcohol produced that same effect later on down the road. Um, but, but I had goals, I had dreams, I had aspirations. And as a matter of fact, I live with that after school special or that, that cautionary tale of, of what to never do, what drugs can make you become. You know, I, I literally witnessed the psychic change that takes place in an individual upon ingesting whatever it is that they're using to take them outside of themselves. Because my father, Jerome, was a great man, a, a phenomenal man. But when he didn't come home for to make dinner at 5.30 and, and we heard the keys hit the lock at 3, 3.30, we shook like leaves because we knew what was coming, you know? And so I witnessed that. And as a matter of fact, I excelled at everything I did to, to prove a point that I would never become that man. Mm. Could not stand him, hated drugs and alcohol even more. Um, so I don't remember the first time that I picked it up, but what I do remember is the first time that someone attempted to stand between me and it. And, and what I learned in my, my, my life to date is that during active addiction and alcoholism, anything that stands between me and, and the bag or the bottle, it, it will go. And it's not personal, it's just business. Right. Um, so my addiction kind of consumed me from a very young age, but it didn't, it, didn't, it didn't block me from still succeeding in other areas of my life. Like I, I went on to... To end up on those TV shows, Viva La Bam, and, and in those jackass movies. Um, continuing to excel at life, doing things again that people would ex to, uh, attribute to success or happiness, maybe even dream of doing. And, and later on down the road, you know, uh, we had written Dream Seller, um, which was an autobiography addiction memoir that did really well. Um, so from an external perspective, people looked at me as if I had it together and, and, and like my life was fucking rad. Right. Um, and it was, it was a lot of times, some of the best times I had ever had in my life to date have been while I was under the influence. Sure. Wouldn't take it back. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of that coin, what my life had really looked like was um, May 25th, 2015, I, I came to in Mercy Hospital uh, after having been in ICU for seven days um, of an overdose. Uh, my mother had bought me a plot. People had taken life insurance policies out mm. of me. Um, I had been medevaced to four different hospitals in four different states from four different overdoses. My mother, in the beginning, would get on her knees and pray to God that she never received that phone call in the middle of the night that I, I had succumbed to my addiction and that she was to come verify my body. You know, she used to pray not to get that phone call that I had died to at the end finding herself praying to God to get that phone call just so she could have a peace of mind, rightfully so. She had sold three homes to financially pay for me to go to two different treatment centers. Uh, I found myself unbeknownst to me in a position that I was completely incapable of getting myself out of. Partly because I had done some things that made it look like I knew what I was doing. 
and people believed that I knew what I was doing. Right. At 38 years old, I find myself coming to as a homeless heroin addict on the streets of Baltimore City, um, standing on the corner of Eastern Avenue in Patterson Park, prostituting my body just to secure enough money to get another uh, bag of heroin, trying to figure out how the fuck I had gotten there. You know, it, it just didn't make sense to me. Um, despite those successful accolades I share with you, uh, the reality of what my life really looked like is... Uh, my worldly possessions, everything that I owned in this world consisted of eight scarves, two jackets, three socks, a stick of deodorant. It all fit into a bag that doubles my pillow, a needle, a spoon, and, and a restraining order that my mother just had served on her 38-year-old son to physically be removed from her house. Um, and I, I wanted to kill myself on a daily basis. I just didn't really want to hurt myself in the process. And I was horrible at suicide because I kept waking up. Um... Although I share with you, I had attempted to get sober 12 previous times out of the 13 overall. I don't look at any of those attempts as being failures. Mm -hmm. um, at the time I did, and, and I think people in my life did, but in retrospect, looking back, it's, 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 it's clear as ever to me that upon, uh, upon each attempt of, of me getting sober, I would learn something. I would learn something and, and, and it was a lot of the times now clear to see it was process of elimination, right? Because I would continuously try to rearrange the furniture on the Titanic, right? And if I just would have did this uh, here at this analogy. time, it would have turned out different. Right. And at, at every one of those attempts, I just rearranged how I really believed that it would work. And although everyone else saw it as a failure, including myself, Treatment center number 13, I had ran out of ways to, to rearrange this furniture. I mean, you fucking name it, I had tried it. I had bought glue, I had stole fucking stamps, I, you know, I had hung it from the ceiling, from the drapes, I, you name it, I tried, I painted it, I, I, I disguised it, I, 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 I... And at the end, it was completely, it was so evident and apparent to me to see that like, you know what the common denominator in my problems were? Me. Yeah. And maybe if I just got out of my way and, 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 and shift from that perspective of, of having that job that consists of knowing everything to come into the realization, May 25th, 2015, walking into the 13th treatment center that, you know what I do know is that I don't fucking know. And my very best thinking places me here every goddamn yeah. time. So it was really, I just, I, I would go in, process of elimination, trial and error, rearrange, wash, rinse, repeat, fuck up over and over and over enough times that I could no longer dismiss or, or minimize or justify the severity of my situation because the, the writing on the wall was in my fucking handwriting. Right. You know, ignorance is bliss, but when you know you're to be held accountable and I could no longer deny the severity of my situation. And, and I could... I, I would always go to meetings and I would always go to treatment centers because I knew my life was going to turn out one of two ways. Either I would get sober or I would die in the interim. Like I wasn't the guy that was okay with just getting high the rest of his life. Right. It was going to be an overdose or I was going to get sober <laughs> because I'm a, I'm a smart guy. I knew there was a better way if I could just get out of my way. Um, and, and, and basically what happened is I, I failed so many goddamn times that when I came in, the pain was finally great enough that I knew that I no longer knew. I dumb my way into it. I can't, but you clearly can because every time I come back for help, you're still fucking here. Right. <laughs> so now my mind is open just enough to become willing to say, hey, can you help me? All as a direct result of an undeniable amount of pain. It was unfucking bearable. I don't change when shit is unmanageable. I change when right. shit is unfucking bearable. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and I took your advice. And guess what? I, I didn't know 13 was the one. It was no, they didn't teach me anything in 13 that they didn't 10 or eight. No new information was received. The only difference was the pain had finally become great enough. All those seeds that were planted among each attempts had finally just blossomed. Things aligned. Um, I had learned enough that I had to become accountable for it. And they always told me, try shooting a bag of dope when it's cut with N.A. <laughs> or drinking a glass of wine when it's cut with A.A. It doesn't quite sit right because I know that there's a better way. And, right. and, uh, and I, I just knew that the pain was so great, I didn't want to feel the way I felt anymore. I didn't know if I was coming or going, staying or leaving. I, I just didn't want to feel I felt 
So when you gave me some suggestions, I followed them, and guess what? I felt better today than I did yesterday. And it just kind of snowball affected to the here and now. Yeah. Okay. So. So let me ask you a question. When you were those 12 times, um, would you have the same process of going back out? Would you, all right, I'm going to start smoking weed. I'm going to start having a couple of beers. How did it go? In the beginning, the process was, I don't have a fucking problem. Okay. I, I merely went here to do this just to prove to my loved ones that I can do this successfully without repercussions. And you guys merely just overreacted again. You just caught me at a bad time on a bad way in a bad day. Tomorrow is going to be different. And I really believe that. And, and now, you know, after having done enough work on myself and the disease from which I've been diagnosed with that I suffer from, I understand I have a very clear cut perspective of, of my situation and the, the danger in it. Um, I understand how powerful it is. And I understand that although that I said that then, it wasn't that I was lying to people because I, I really believed it. I, I really right. believed it. Like if you put a polygraph on me, I, I'd yeah, pass. You're with buying your own bullshit. Yeah, I wasn't like like just getting over on you. That's just the disease of addiction that lies to me in my own voice that makes me believe the unbelievable. Right on. Um, because I had been so disconnected from reality that now the abnormal has become the normal. And that's just, that is what it is. Right. Um, so in the beginning, there was no, you know, restraint from pen and tongue, if you will, <laughs> they, that it, it was just, I just had to kind of rearrange it or do it differently. And, um, as time progressed, it was pretty apparent, but I wasn't willing to give up wine because when I drink wine, I, I don't shake when I don't have it. I don't steal to get it. I don't lie when I'm doing it. You know, I, I couldn't understand how that was a direct correlation back to me intravenously sure shooting heroin and cocaine over and over but I fucked up one time I <laughs> went to rehab and I, I was with my fiance who's now my ex because she clearly likes to get between me and the drugs <laughs> so she has to go and and I came out and I was gung-ho right like I really wanted to stay so I wanted to stay clean uh and 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 she said she came to visit and I was just about to get out and she said well you know just as long as we drink you'll be okay and I said I can't I said, my therapist told me that I'm different, that at the bottom of my wine glass is a needle every time. And she goes, oh, I get I, that makes sense, motherfucker. Because like a month into me getting out, I wanted to start drinking again. And she's right. like, you can't. I'm like, why the fuck did I tell her? <laughs> you know, and um, I had tried, I had attempted, I would come out, I would do good. And and and, and it just kind of washed rinse to pee. But I would, I would go out, I would start drinking. And then with drinking, I had to get cocaine. And then I had to go to bed so I get some Xanax. And uh, before I knew it, that barrier that I had created or built up between me and the next drink or drug diminished. No and then wow. it went from like, no, absolutely no heroin or cocaine to like, ah, oh, what's the big deal? I'll just sniff it this time. I won't shoot it. Sure. It's wild. So um, there's got to be, I mean, listen, of course, this is, um, we're having a serious conversation. You, you've got to have some great bars in your lifetime that, that you remember. Uh, enjoying from time to time uh what were some of the best bars you've ever been to in? and what what sticks out to you as some of the best times you've had in them generally the best bars i've ever been to and the best times i've had in them are the ones that i'm no longer allowed in got it <laughs> really <laughs> like here's it put into perspective the only bar that i believe i'm allowed in in westchester is barnaby's really and who the fuck wants to go there <laughs> i'm not i'm allowed there because i never went there it wasn't my kind of deal you know what i mean they didn't really care for me i didn't care for them I think I attempted to sue them one time. Um, <laughs> but, dude, my life was just a blur yeah. forever. Um, someone talked to me about spring break once. and I've been, I've been on spring break for fucking 22 years. Like, legit. Um, you know, so now when I'm sober and people talk about, oh, what's your triggers? And, and, and I got to stay. And I'm like... I get that everyone has, you know, different levels from which they suffer from, but I'm the kind of guy whose trigger is when his fucking eyelids open, mm -hmm. right? So I, I'll justify why any time, place, feeling, or sensation makes sense to have a glass of wine or a shot of heroin. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I think, dude, oddly enough, I've become really good at quitting things. And it's just because I, I, I give it over to my higher power. I, I, it's a whole spiritual thing. Yeah, sure. But, um, 
I've 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 fucking done tons of things in tons of bars, tons of cocaine and tons of bathrooms. Fucked many a women in many a bathrooms. Um, kicked out of many a bars, arrested in many a bars, skipped out a lot of tabs in many a bars. <laughs> yeah. You know, but again, some of the best times I've ever had in my life. A very big fucking amends process that I'm making. You know, the 28th of every month, I have to send out uh, some checks to some people. That I, that I owe all over, and I'm continuing to be reminded of new people I owe amends to. We were filming something in Westchester the other day for my documentary, and this guy walks by, he goes, oh, Novak, you know you owe me 60 or 90 bucks. And I'm like, no. And then I did, and I had to pay. You know what I mean? So that's like a common occurrence in my life because everything was just a fucking blur, man. How long, how long were you living uh, at Bam's house? Yeah. <sighs> I dare to venture maybe nine months. I hate saying it because I know Franz is in the room and he knows the exact amount because he <laughs> like does my timelines. But I, I would dare to say nine years. It's uh, it's it. I'll tell you what I was I was saying to Franz before. I think you guys are a really big part of um, pop culture in this country. You know what I mean? There's a whole whole seen um that you guys are a very big part of uh of pop culture that you know it's 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 a really cool experience to see um what it did you know that i don't, I don't think there's a person in the country that doesn't know what what jackass you know is or, or or was at one time um i know you're not allowed to talk about what's going on right now with uh with the new movie uh but it's got to be exciting i'm sure um does let me ask you <sighs> So, myself being, you know, I went through uh, in recovery and whatnot, um, being in the bar business and in the hospitality industry, um, I noticed, I was watching you today, you know, over at my place, um, in and out, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? I do that constantly. I live above it, but I won't spend more than 10, 15 minutes of a clip in there. And it's not, you know, they constantly say, like, you know, it's not the... It's the guy that can have one or two beers that's got his shit together. He's the one who's going to take you back out. It's not It's like your asshole buddies from back in the day. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you, know, you look at them, you're like, all right, you know, he's got his shit together. I, I can do the same thing. Yeah. And the next thing you know, you're doing all that old shit again, you know. Um, and it's definitely a tight a tight rope to walk um, in the hospitality industry. But the, uh, there are a lot of people that can do it. Uh, there's a lot of um, people in bars, even dive bars um, in the field every region that I know that that haven't had a, you know, a drink or a drug in, you know, 20, 30 years. Um, and, and they're known for it. And people kind of look out for me after a while. You know what I mean? You know, in the beginning, it's kind of like, how long is this guy going to last? But, you know, after a certain amount of time, it's like, no, no, dude's been clean or, 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 or sober for a long time. And they look out for him, you know, yeah. you know, even, even in those little divey bars. Um, it's an, it's an interesting dichotomy to be involved in, in a hospitality business and to be in recovery at the same time. And a lot of people told me I, I would never be able to do it. But I excelled by diving back into the business. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like really doing shit, like putting my head back in the game. I went out to work in, in big corporate environments, big box environments. Uh, did a lot of openings um, for, um, you know, casinos and um, uh, corporate places and whatnot. And I learned systems that way. And I, and I really did well because I grew up in the business. I was third generation. My grandfather started that bar you're in today. Uh, we've been there almost 70 years. And a lot of people are like, there's no way that this kid's going to make it. You know what I mean? But I said, fuck you. And I just tore into it. You know what I mean? And, I, and I'm proud of myself for that now. You know what I mean? And I'm proud of the direction that I took. But, you know, it is tough. You know, that uh, this business, the hospitality business, is the land of the misfit toys. You know what I mean? It really is. It's, it's all the people that never thought they were going to be doing what they're doing, whether you're a chef or a bartender. You had another fucking desire or another, another something else that you, you had a dream <laughs> in the back of your mind. You know what I mean? That you were going to be, you know, whether it be pro skater or whatever it is, you know, maybe fucking actor. It doesn't matter. But they wind up bartending on the side and whatnot, and then it becomes their business, and then it becomes their livelihood. And some people really love it, and, be, and you know, it is the the band of the misfit toys. If you could give any advice to anybody in the hospitality industry, I'm sure you know some in recovery. Yeah. Um, what What would it be? Dude, that's one of the raddest things I think about recovery is that it gives us, for the first time, if you're anything like me, it gives me choices and options. Because when I was caught up in active addiction and alcoholism, I, I didn't get to do things. I had to do things. I didn't have the privilege of choice. 
right? That, <laughs> that thing called, I answered. It dictated who I went with, when I went, and, and how I went about it, it, it right? Like it took the, the power of choice out of my life. So I, I were, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very proactive in my recovery. I, I, I have a sponsor, I sponsor guys. I work the 12 steps. I attend 12 step meetings and, um, and I work with guys and they're like, well, and one of my biggest things that I like to impress upon them is that remember that now you have choices. You, you, you get, you know, to do these things. You don't have to, right? You, you don't have to go to work. You get to go to work. You don't have to pay your bill. You get to pay your bill. And it's kind of a shift in perspective mm. um, because that's where my disease is centered in now is perspective and mine. Um, so I'm a big fan of fucking doing whatever you like. Do it, man. If it's, I have a sponsee who's a bartender. Fucking bartend. It, because if you're like me and, and you're in my sponsorship family, all it is is, the, the, the 12 steps deliver us to have this spiritual experience, which allows us the complete freedom to go with whoever we want, whenever we want, wherever we want. You know, for my third year anniversary, or my four year anniversary, I went to Amsterdam to a 12 step meeting and picked up my four year medallion. Most people don't go to Amsterdam to celebrate sobriety. <laughs> Fuck that, I went with my tattoo artist who who spent a lot of nights fucking sniffing blow and banging broads in the red light district with my also my best friend in recovery. Uh, he didn't do the blow part, but he was banging the girls in the red light district. <laughs> but you know, I can go there and do that. And now I have the power of choice because I don't have to be a prisoner of any set situation, right? I, 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 I'm a man that can leave when I want. Uh, I know enough. So I always encourage people to like, follow your dreams, man. Like yeah. I didn't get sober to live in a fucking, a, a, a four walled room of a 12 step meeting. Right. As a matter of fact, just getting sober isn't enough for me. It was enough in the very beginning, but now that was like mere, I wasn't even like getting close to the surface. That was literally the beginning of life getting sober. Right. You know, so, so dude, follow your dreams. But, know what you're doing getting into it point in hand we're fucking full steam ahead on this documentary of mine and what that means is for the last two days we were in baltimore city and we were driving through all the projects all the hoods where i bought dope and coke yesterday we were at the treatment center that i went in and we filmed a scene in the bathroom and i and i took my clothes off and i got a shower in the shower I laid in the bedroom of the bed, the bed in the bedroom where I was. You know, I've really been submerged in that world right. for the last three days. That last night I had a dream that I was back there doing that, mm -hmm. you know, and I haven't been to a meeting since and I'll be going tomorrow, but my time just has not allowed me to go. So the point that I'm trying to make is that, that, as a direct result of the 12 step program that I worked, meaning I've experienced the 12 steps, I have this now heightened sense of awareness to know that like, okay, I need to kind of reshift, recalibrate and, 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 and prioritize a little bit better. Right. Right. Like I, I can't afford another day. I mean, I probably could, to be honest with you, I could afford like a, to go down and do that for a few more days, but I'm a firm believer if I'm not proactive in my recovery and my sobriety, I continue to go to the barbershop. One day I will get a haircut, sure. yeah. Yeah. you know, so, but I know what it takes for me to be proactive. It means that I have to, I have to trust God. I have to clean house and I have to help others. And when that triangle is connected, there's no way that I will fail, right. you know? So I know, um, but I'm aware of it. I didn't just like leave treatment, sit down the bag of heroin, the glass of wine and just jump right back into it. There had to be a lot of work in order for me to, again, that internal work that was an absolute requirement to get the external results that I've always desired, which is like peace, freedom, serenity, right. self-esteem, um, accountability, uh, you know, acceptability, spiritual, you know, I, I've, yeah. So yeah, do it, man. Don't, don't, don't get sober to, to not follow your dreams or do what you wanna do. Just know what you're getting into and what the other side of that coin can look like. Yeah, just I think, because I got sober doesn't mean the rest of the world did. Right. Sure, sure, I think it, I think it, for me, that's, that's exactly how I felt, you know, going through, uh, behavioral health in Palm beach. Right. I went, I did 30 days down there Yeah. and I started hearing the haircut analogy, you know, cause I'm in the bar business mm -hmm. and I was like, look, 
I care so much about the bar business that I'm willing to give up alcohol. Yeah. Just to be in the bar business. Yeah. Sounds crazy, but like, you know, that's that's sort of where my journey started when it when it came to you know, a couple a couple days in, well, let's say a weekend cuz a couple of days, you know, you know what's going on, but uh, you know, a weekend, you start hearing these things, you you introduce yourself and what you do for a living and all that and it's it's like what the <laughs> I get the same shit. I remember what that. The yeah. Fuck, you know. Yeah. It's like you do what? I, I got to give up everything, you know? It's like and you sort of <laughs> You talk about it, and then as you as you start getting perspective and, and, and clarity on what it, what what that business means to me, right? It's not that I'm selling, you know, the devil's potion. I'm selling widgets to people who can eat and drink widgets without turning into an asshole. Sure, <laughs> I might not enjoy that luxury. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, it. so it just it is what it is, right? So, um, but it took me a little bit. There was some there was some uncertainty there. To Rightfully say to myself, so. what, what am I going to do? Yeah. Am I going to sell everything when I get back? And, What's your qualification? And fucking now go do something else? World, yeah, exactly. Sure. So, um, you know, but for me, it, it's, it's, and, and I think it's similar to, to PJ, and I've been lucky that, to have him sort of like, you know, guide me a little bit, yeah. is um, it's what I want to do in life. And the things that were blocking me from doing what I want to do in life, I'm able to push aside and focus on, you know, light at the end of the tunnel and focus on what it is that I want to be when I grow up. Well, because ironically, yeah. you know, being an alcoholic who had to go to treatment for alcohol, who happens to own a bar, guess what? You, <laughs> the irony in all of that is that your situation has nothing to do with alcohol. That has nothing to do with your problem. Being an alcoholic does, uh, does not mean that the alcohol is your problem. It does not mean that the bar is your problem or, or, or none of that is the problem. The problem, that's actually the solution. That's the answer to your problem. Thank God there was alcohol because that was a solution to your problem, right? The problem is our thinking, our attitude, and our behavior. Right. So once we know that, like I, I can, I'm an interventionist. There, there's multiple occasions, uh, multiple times in my life where I have hands full of heroin, and never once do I think, you know, yeah. no one even knows I have this. Right. I'm six years sober. I could do a little bit and get away with it. Because I've done the work that's required that allows me to have that that freedom, that 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 really the promises, uh, and I'm not going to get into the whole all that because it's really not this. But um, it tells me that if I do this, I can get this, mm -hmm. and I've done this to now get this freedom, right? To where I, I no longer wish to to shut the door on the past. Uh, I completely accept it, right? Like I I don't hide from it. I welcome it. I don't, I don't cringe at the thought of going into a bar. I'm actually okay with it. Yeah. And the reason why I just kept walking out today is because not that I was ever tempted by a drink or a drug. It's because I get bored. I agree. I, yeah. I, I don't have anything in common with a guy sitting at a bar. I agree. Not that anything's wrong with what he's doing, yep. but I'm not on the same page. Right. Right. I, I, I'm somewhere else going in a different direction. His is his and mine's mine. But I can do that. You know, I can be in the hood for the last three days, literally driving past as they're screaming out you know uh the names of the dope and the names of the coke and never do i think like i could get it and i have the money so yeah you brought up about um dreaming about it being down there right mm -hmm. this last night i had a dream about it you know just being in that world so tell, tell me tell me what your feelings are after you have a drug dream i love it <laughs> <laughs> i fucking love it I don't love the, the actual, because there's been dreams where I, I've, I have the act of getting high in the dream. I never wake up like, oh, that was so great. I'm like, thank God, because that dream fucking sucked. Okay. Like, thank God I didn't got do it, that for it. real. It's never like, oh, yeah, fuck yeah, I got a free shot of dope. You know, because in the dream, when I think that I did it, I'm like, I can't believe I just gave everything away. Mm -hmm. Right. I made one impulsive decision that is completely now going to change the trajectory of my life to shit. Have you ever woke up feeling guilty? No, I've just been woke up feeling really grateful that okay. I didn't actually good, do it, good. that it was not real. Yeah. I used to wake up feeling guilty in the beginning when I had those. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, damn, I fucked up. And like, no, well, yeah, 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 you know yeah. I mean? that, that's like immediate, like fucking fear and yeah. impending doom. Like, what did I just do mm -hmm. to thank God? And that's yeah. why I like him because it, it, it gives me this gratitude sure. that sometimes I don't have much of because I've been sober for a little bit now. Um, tell us a little bit about your documentary, what you're doing. Man, this documentary is uh, is something that, again, things aligned. They've aligned. It started out with a 
with a, a, a very good friend of mine in Baltimore who we grew up skateboarding together by the name, a guy by the name of Jason Chapman who owns uh, a skate park there and, and a very big staple in the community of skateboarding in Baltimore. And years ago, while I was in the, the depths of my addiction, he came to me and he said, hey, Brandon, would you be interested in doing a documentary about your life? And I said, sure. And he said, these interviews will pay cash on hand per interview. And now, mind you, I'm in the midst of a fucking serious heroin habit. So all I hear is cash on hand, heroin every day, fuck yeah, let's film. So I'd call him up every day, let's film, let's film, let's film. Finally, the, I continued to get worse. My disease progressed. No one believed that I was going to like outlive this thing to have a successful ending and they really didn't know what the ending was going to be because it was just me getting high and robbing lying cheating stealing manipulating ribbon and running yeah wash rinse repeat and there was just no ending in sight and um and it, it just kind of it got stagnant it sat and then i went to treatment <laughs> and and this time i went to treatment and i had nobody and it wasn't the people just weren't my friends when i'm drinking and i'm drugging people have to leave me for the safety of themselves and myself, they have to create a fucking distance between us. And I'm in treatment and I have nobody. My, nobody's coming to see me. And and uh, lo and behold, Joe Franz shows up one day. And, and prior to him showing up, we were not on good terms. Um, as most of my life was, I, I had created this false sense of reality, this delusional world and this narrative that only made sense to me. And I believe that everyone else just kind of knew it as I saw it or thought it. And I had believed that, that Franz like was doing things that I did not agree with. Um, and that he was like, just disrespecting me and, and however that looks. Um, and I had a lot of choice words that I had said to him and, and, and said a lot of things. And, and finally he comes to rehab and no one else was coming. And he said, where's everybody at? I said, what do you mean? He said, where's everybody? Where's your family? Where's your friends? And I said, you're fucking it, man. <laughs> and he was it. And he, I didn't like him at the time, but he was it. He was the only one who was showing up. And, um, and he sat down and, and we talked and I was still very reserved. I was still playing this mental chess game that only existed in my mind. But every, everything that I said had to align with, with what you told him. You know what I mean? Right. And um, so I was very cautious and, and uh, particular about what I shared. And, and I didn't like that because I knew that like, again, I didn't know it then. But what I know now is that my thinking was the problem and it always sure. placed me in those positions. But I was starting to catch on to that without even doing the work yet. I was like, dude, I had heard in treatment. If you always do what you always did, you're always going to get what you always got. And I had heard that in one of the umpteenth tries prior to sure. this one. So I knew it. And I'm like, this, something has to change. Something has to give, but I'm not willing to show my cards. And, and even though he's telling me what he feels, I'm like, this fucker's lying. So my therapist, um, Christina, set up a thing for us where she did like a family kind of almost like a, I've never been married or divorced, but like when you're getting divorced, you have someone comes in and they kind of, what's the person mediator mediator. Yeah. Yes. And, and like mediated this, this, the mending of this relationship. And I felt secure in that because I believe that my shit was fucking probably delusional, but not fully, but I trusted in her. So I'm like, okay, here it is. I gave it to her. And, and, and when she told me what I should do, I, I believed in her. And, and I did what she suggested. And then lo and behold, he started sharing with me. He's like, I had no fucking idea that you thought that. And, I'm, and he like really didn't. And I'm a pretty good judge of character. And I can read people and, to an extent. And, and, you know, certain things that I was talking about, he really didn't know. Some things he did know, you know. And, and uh it created a foundation, a base, a, a starting point for this relationship to move forward. And that's when he said, well, what do you think about we get into the sequel of Dream Seller, The Streets of Baltimore? And, and I had no faith in my ability to, to write because when I had written the first book, I wrote it on uh, sniffing an abundance of cocaine and drinking an endless amount of red wine. So I believed that that made me very descriptive and, mm -hmm. and very fucking poetic and blah, blah, blah. And I just had no faith, but I knew that like, 
my behaviors had to change. So he's like, he talks to my therapist again. They carve out, instead of me going to one of the regular groups in the day, they, they made an, a special group for me where it was just an hour to myself. And he brought a, 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 a dictator phone, what's it called? A, a video, a recorder, and with batteries and a list of topics he wanted me to, to expand on. And they gave it to the therapist and the therapist would give it to me for my group and I would go sit out at this picnic table and I, and I had no faith in my ability to produce anything worth fucking while. But I said, you know what, I'm just gonna do it because I told him I would do it. And the first week he dropped the stuff off and I go through and, I, and I'm speaking and I'm not writing it so it's a completely different format. And he comes back and again, I, I have no faith in what I've just produced and I'm like, here you go, dude. He takes it home, he comes back and he said, this is some of the best, the next week, this is some of the best work that you've ever produced. Yeah. We have these new characters that were developed that you've never said, you know, that the fog had lifted and I kind of started getting this clarity and this memory that I didn't know existed. So that worked, that worked. Now he still has no part of this documentary. We finished the book, the documentary that just kind of was stagnant. Right, it was treading water at best. There was no really direction to an ending because no one knew my life was kind of in a really uncertain place, and they predicted it would end in my death. Right, and and rightfully so. But then I get sober. I defy odds. I, I not only get sober, but I stay sober. So now I'm defying odds and logic. And uh, and 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 with any sober person, I believe we don't get to where we're at because we're fucking dumb. We get to where we're at, meaning recovery, because we're too smart for our own good. Sure, yeah, <laughs> right? sure. We outthink ourselves out of most good situations 100%. and yeah. act off impulse, and then I'm like, why the fuck did we do that? Um, but I got sober, I stayed sober, I started following these suggestions of the recommendations of my mentors, my sponsors, my therapists, all these people that were doing work with me, and my life started getting really good really fast. Um, I started meaning what I said and saying what I meant. I started to create these healthy boundaries. I, I started to speak with conviction. I started to not lie. Holy fuck, right? Like I started to be honest. I started to show up when I said I would. People started to depend, depend on me. They started to rely on me. And then I found myself in the careers that I have now, which is, you know, I work in the drug and alcohol treatment field. I'm a, I'm a motivational speaker. I'm an interventionist. I, I do a lot of PR for a treatment center. I, I help people. I aid and assist into to finding the adequate, appropriate treatment depending upon the individual I'm speaking with nationwide. My phone rings nonstop, um, which means I'm also now like speaking all over the nation. I'm the, the keynote speaker for the DEA. The, wow. for the FBI has, has contracted me to do some of their talks. Unfortunately, COVID hit. That kind of came to a halt. Um, all these, you know, sharing the stage with the first lady, um, you know, all these crazy places. But the ending of my story, my recovery seemed to take on a life within its own. And the, the guy who and originally had it, Jason Chapman, he just was incapable of finishing the project. It got too big, too fast, too quick. Now, Franz had no part of this project. We worked together on the books, nothing to do with the documentary. But as fate would have it, as the alignments took place, Franz's schedule kind of opened up. He, we kind of, we, we hit like a, a deadlock, right? We, Chapman couldn't finish it. It was unrealistic to believe that he could finish it. He didn't want to just give it to anybody, all this footage that he had. Somebody with a vested interest. Yeah. yeah. And, and he didn't trust just anybody or any of the people that I work with, like my other teams. Right. I was frustrated. I just kind of hung it up and I believed that something could happen. I just didn't know how but I knew that it would because we had spent so much time and, mm -hmm. and you know, time in this. And, uh, and, and then all of a sudden Franz said, you know, what do you think if I produce it? What do you think if I make this movie? And I, I, I said, I couldn't think of a better person to do that. You know, Franz and I have worked together for fucking ever. He knows my history, I know his. He can complete my sentences. Literally, he knows my timeline, he knows He's done the due diligence. And then Chapman is the kind of guy that that would be the only person that he would give this footage over to. Yeah. You know? The so only it, one that he would trust yeah, with it. Literally. Yeah. So th now, like, it's all come together. We have all this original contents. We have the, an abundance of footage. Like, 
prior to sobriety. So it's not even like the kind of documentary where you would need voiceovers to kind of string it along. We have mm -hmm. all the actual footage from the actual events nice. that make this thing go from A to Z. We're just kind of doing pickup shots to like make it look really pretty. But um, we're full steam ahead, man, and, and we have something really fucking powerful. So nice. when are you talking about launching it? The... That's not a question I could answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a Franz question when you get him on here. Got it, got it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, um, something that that's going to help a lot of people. It, it's just God's work. Yeah. And I hate saying fucking God cause we're like, oh, fucking the, you know, the religious <laughs> fucking holy roller. It's not that don't get your panties in a bunch. It's just, yeah. it's just a power greater than myself that does you for me what me. I can't do for me. Yep. Um, because the position that you see me in today, I'm not clever enough of, of finding myself in. I, 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 I couldn't paint this picture for what you view me in. I, that all I simply did was know that I no longer know, know that I'm the common denominator of my problems. I got out of my way, admitted that I can't do this, but like people that have came before me that are still doing it can, can you show me? And now I just woke up with like a, a pretty fucking on paper and to the external successful guy. Yeah, I, I fucking, you know, got my GED while incarcerated. <laughs> like I didn't set out for this shit. So we were, uh, when we were over at the bar, guy, uh, guy came in the bar. He goes, yeah, he goes, uh, what did, what did he say to me? He said, uh, cause yeah, he, he did it. He spent a little bit of time at, uh, in my vacation house or something like that. Oh no, my hotel. What are you talking about? He goes, yeah, George Hill, George Hill prison. <laughs> yeah. That's where I got my GED. Yeah, yeah. I got my GED in there only because if you passed your GED in there, you, you were supplied a pizza party from Domino's. No, no shit. So it's just same with alcoholism and addiction, sense. right? But I, I'm defiant by nature. I hate authority and I'll never fucking conform unless it becomes my idea. Right. So when you kindly suggest what I should do to save my life, I kindly suggest why you should fuck off <laughs> because I possess that job that consists of knowing everything. Come to the realization, what I do know is that I don't know, right? My life gets insanely better in a really short period of time. Same with that pizza party, doing fucking 23 and one in George W. Hill in isolation, right? Did my first 90 days, uh, 23 and one. Allowed out one hour of the day in handcuffs, had to shower with handcuffs for 90 fucking days while withdrawing from methadone, Xanax, and heroin at the same time. Um, they said, hey, would you, would you be interested in taking these GED courses? If you pass, you get a pizza party supplied by Domino's. I'm like, that's a no fucking brainer. <laughs> but here's the, here's the beauty in that fucking story that seems really irrelevant. I aced that fucking GED like a Harvard graduate. I swear to God, I did not miss one question. And it wasn't because I wanted to call my mother and say, your son's a high school graduate. It was because I wanted the fucking pizza party. But the point of the story is the reason why I did so well is because it was my idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the reason why I did so well as sobriety, it was my idea. Yeah, yeah. You know, as, um, as owner operators in, um, in this business, a, a lot of times you have to, with defined employees, you have to make it look like it's their idea, whatever you want to get them yeah. to do. It's the same same type of psychology. Franz is very good at that. <laughs> uh, he's taught me, really, because I get very frustrated. I'm like, dude, fuck this. Fuck this person. Fuck this position. Fuck this thing. Whatever it is. And I listen, right? And, and he kind of has a way of talking to people and meeting them where they're at and making them think that, like, it was... And now I... I it not, But in the world of me working in treatment, helping people get into treatment, I'll talk to a man, a woman, and I'll let them fucking rant for 20 minutes, an hour, and, and ultimately, although I've dotted every I and crossed every T and I've put this plan together from A to Z, there's not one second that's not accounted for, I'll, I'll present it in a way to where they believe they've came up with it. And they're yeah. like, fuck yeah, let's do this. And I'm like, yeah. fuck. But so in the recovery world, I can do it. But now shifting the perspective of like the business world or the film world and, and again, my instant gratification, I don't like the word no and I believe that we yeah. can do whatever needs to be done. Yeah. Um, you know, trying to get permits, trying to get people to film us or, or, or allow us to film them and to set them up to say a certain thing, I, I get really frustrated. Yeah. And I, I learn from other people like Franz and, and other, whoever it is doing whatever. Mm -hmm. That's cool, man. How's your, uh, how's your relationship with Steve-O? Great, man. Yeah. He's fucking, he looks he, great. He's, uh, I've thought about asking him to sponsor me, but like, he's like, so sober that it's fucking it can be scary <laughs> like, really there's a lot of accountability there like he's he's literally a guy that i i think of and 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 reference so often 
as like who I want to become. Yeah. But there's a lot of, uh, a lot of accountability. If, if you want to make You're both that move. Similar dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Very similar. So, um, in, in dream sour and especially this, I was talking about the grittiness of it. I feel like I am thrown into the wire set. I, I mean, it just, there's so many similarities and it's, it, did you watch the wire? Number one. Fuck yeah. My claim to fame with The Wire, the very last episode when Omar got killed mm -hmm. by that little kid in the bodega, yeah. that bodega was my grandfather's uh, uh, produce market. He owned the first open-air produce market in Baltimore City called Novak's Produce. No shit. Wow. And they tore it down since. But it, when you would go there, even when that kid got, when Omar got killed by the little kid, it still said Novak's well front, even though wow. it turned into like a little bodega with the fucking fireproof glass and shit. So one of your... Shakespearean characters you have in this book. Um, what do you call them? Slow moving, slow moving. Uh, what do you call them? Oh uh, yeah, the deadhead. So you, you talk about how there is no stores in that twelve block radius or whatever it is mm -mm. in the city, and you wind up going out and buying a bunch of dollar uh, dollar store goods and reselling them. You know, at you know at a big profit, just like Bubs did in the Wire. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's the. the it's all the grip, The hustles man. are very similar. Yeah, it's hustles, yeah. You know? Uh, and in that in that area, that 12-block radius where stores really don't consist, the ones that do are dollar store kind of stores. Yeah. You're not going to find a fucking Neiman Marcus in, <laughs> in that 12-block radius. You're going to find a five below, a dollar store. Sure. You know? Baltimore's rough, man. Rough town. Be more careful, they call it. Murder more. It's crazy. My dad died down there. I was telling you earlier. Um I remember going, we stayed in the, I stayed in the hotel right around the corner from University of Maryland Hospital. And I had a little balcony. I went out and there was a 45 slug, slug, not a shell, <laughs> slug sitting on, on the fucking concrete. Right. And it, there was just, it was night, you had gunshots left and right and you're downtown, you know, yeah. there's, there's no part of that downtown excluding Inner Harbor that you feel, you know, safe at. It's like Philly's got its pockets, right? You got yeah. Kenzo and whatnot. Um, but Baltimore's rough, dude. It's a fucking rough town. Really rough town. A lot of good recovery down there, though. It is. We were completely submerged in it for the last two days, literally. Yeah. And that was the agenda of the trip. And it's I, I have this like uh, this place in my heart for that. Sure. I, I thoroughly enjoy like going down, doing that, driving through the woods. Yeah, absolutely. But I just can't do it for an extended period of time because then I start like dreaming about it, and then I'm like, fuck, I have to go to a meeting. <laughs> yeah, I give you credit, man. I mean, it's, the awareness. You have a, a lot, um, you had some bottoms that were just unreal. And I, I'm very, very thankful you're sitting across from this table from us today. Yeah, I guess, you know, from your perspective, doing all this filming and, and being kind of in the action and visiting these places in Baltimore, I know you say, like, you have, your trigger is when you open your eyes in the morning or mm -hmm. your eyelids open. Yeah, yeah. And I think I asked the question because for me, you know, I'm walking in and out of bars that are my business, right? So in a similar way, I'm walking into the dungeon. Sure. But it's the way I make a living, right? Do you feel pressure on a daily basis doing what you're doing now? You know what I think about? I don't think about that often. But occasionally it will cross my mind because people are like, you know, that's kind of a fucking heavy hat to wear. This right. like face of recovery. And it can be. But I'm the kind of guy that does really well with conditions and accountability, right? I'm very routine. I'm very regimented. Uh, my days are pretty monotonous, at least my recovery, not really my days, but my, the, the things that I do throughout right, right. are very repetitious. Um, and, and it's nice to have something to really be held accountable to because I was not the guy that would, would use when things were horrible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was the guy that would use, I, like when things were horrible, I would tighten up because I'm like, dude, all right, now's the time to like fucking sort out you this, make right? them believe this, yeah. get my shit back. I'm the guy that would fuck up when things were good. Yeah. So now this this accountability that I have with what I do and, and the works that are done and and what I kind of represent and stand for is, 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 is good. Because now I think more so than most, this is all hypothetical, but this is shit that crossed my mind. If, if I didn't do what I did, I don't know if I would like 
you know, take a girl out on a date and she's like, I'm going to get a glass of wine. If I would say, Hmm, maybe I'll get one. I'm six years right, sober. Right. Like things are different. But now I, I, and this is not being egotistical, but the facts are I, I'm recognized more now for what I do today than I was then from what I was doing then. Meaning like sobriety, motivational talks, changing my life than like Viva La Bam Jackass. Right, sure, sure. So, so it's like, it's, it, it, to me, it does me well. It gives me this, this added sense of accountability that, that if it wasn't there, things were great. I could slice a glass of wine and no one, you know, not. Yeah, right, right. So yeah, in a weird way, I, I do appreciate it and I'm grateful for it. Yeah. Yeah, my hardest thing is, you know, everybody you sit on this side of the bar with wants to have a drink with the, with the, yeah. the owner of the bar. For the party, know? bro. Yeah, so a, a large change for me was, you know, not being the center of the party, but just being kind of, you know, kind of walking around in the party, you know what I mean, a little bit. Not using or, you know, drinking, but being there, being there with the people and letting them be the, the center of the party, opposed to always having to be the person that is ordering a round of shots or, yeah. or you know, text everybody to come out because there's a NCAA basketball game on that we all want to watch, you know, that kind of thing, and it's... It's a challenge. Well, that's the, 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 the behaviors, right? Yeah. And that's the problem, the behaviors, and, and the behaviors are changing because of the core of my disease is that I'm selfish and I'm self-centered. So it's me, 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 and if I have two minutes, you, but only if it's going to benefit me. Right. So from what you just said, from your own volition, you know, you went from being that life of the party, come over NCAA, to now just kind of stepping back and letting them do that and just observing and being aware, right. you know, which is what I think a a successful owner of a business would do in their place of work. Right, right. You know, so it's just kind of reevaluating and taking different stance. And I think the behaviors are changing and that's why you're able to do that. Yeah. I, I think it'd be really hard for you still trying to live that way while staying sober. Yeah. I think no, it doesn't right. fucking you're make right, sense. Right, right, right. right. You know? It all leads to the same place. It does. Yeah. It does. And, but that's the, that's the, anchor, the, the, anchor, in, in, the, the fucking, I can't, pronounce the word right now but the of of addiction and alcoholism it's just it's not a one size fits all black and white case what works for me might not work right, for right. you and that's the, the that's why it's so tough it's it's not like hey i did this you do this you'll get this yeah. i have i have a lot of friends that don't do the 12 step based you know meeting sure, stuff sure. and they're the sober buffet, right? and they're yeah, great yeah. And, yeah, they're, and who they're am not... i to say that their way is not the right way right Dude, if your life, I don't give a fuck what you do. They're if not white knuckling it either because yeah. they don't they don't have to for them. Yeah. And if you are white knuckling it and you love your life, fucking keep white. Who am I yeah, to yeah, say right, your right. way is wrong? Yeah. You know. Yeah, that was a, at the at the right. end of my my little trip down the Florida to be up, um, mm -hmm. as we refer to it. Yeah. Um, at the end, I knew whatever path I chose was the path that I chose, and I'm armed with all this knowledge of really how to be a better person yeah you know mm -hmm. and i and i've 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 tried you know a few times to to you know go on vacation and have a few in the center it just it just doesn't feel right yeah it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not the same you it's, know it's, i'm not who i am yeah. you know when i do it's, that I, that's what i was saying it's, it's hard to admit that yeah it's hard to say that out loud sometimes you know but it's once you know it's better right yeah, yeah. Ignorance is no longer bliss because yep. you know my friend yeah. <laughs> that's why i say when i'm giving a talk uh, and someone puts their hand up for the first time ever being in like a meeting or, or some kind. And I'm like, please allow me to be the first person to tell you your drinking and drugging career is now fucked. I am now going to completely destroy your drinking and drugging career because you're going to learn some things about the disease from which you have that made you believe you should come listen to a guy who's sober tell his story. People call me like, man, I'm fucking doing this, doing that, smoking, sniffing, eating, drinking, and I'm watching your video. And I'm like, your life fucking sucks. Not because you're drinking or drugging, but because you're drinking and drugging while watching my motivational sober talk at the same time. Right. Fuck that party. <laughs> Who the fuck was... Dude, if I'm fucking blowing lines and fucking shooting dope, I want to fuck a yeah. hooker on the table. I don't want to watch your sober motivational talk. Fuck you. <laughs> dude, my heart goes out to you if you're getting loaded and watching one of my sober talks. The game is up, man. Your party sucks. <laughs> you fucking can't no. do it right, man. So I get it. <laughs> It's cool, though. It's all cool, man. It's not that heavy. <laughs> you look great, man. I feel good. Fucking thank God. Finally, the, yeah. the internal, I think, matches the external. Great. What was this picture? That was year. across from your bar. I know, but when was it? I don't know. I'm horrible with years. 
I don't I mean, know. Even your coloring but, between oh, here and there. Oh, oh, no, no. That's Telling, not. Coloring's everything, man. That, that's crazy. when we went, Franz and I went, and he'll know the year of that, too. We went to Baltimore. I was living at BAMS. And uh, we walked down. I was That picture was taken in the alley where I lived in this abandoned garage under a house that I had to sneak in and out of every day with this big fucking door that I had to open, hopefully without the people that lived above it hearing it. Right. And I'm sick, withdrawing. It was just, oh, God. And there was this dirty toilet in there. Ain't gonna um, live that way, bro. Nah, but that picture was taken of me in the alley, okay. like reflecting on that period in time in my life. But then we recreated that across the street from your bar. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if you ever saw that. Where mm -hmm. That's when I first met you. But he splurged it in with then to now, and I don't know, some fucking movie magic stuff. Editing. Appreciate Great, you being man. here, man. Share your story. Fun. Yeah, this right, is goes uh, a long way. You know, there's a lot of people in this business that that need help, and uh, you know, that's the unfortunate you know. thing. They, yeah. they, there's a lot that need, need it, it, but yeah. there's few who want it. Yeah. But on the off chance that anyone out there is listening and does want it, they can call me directly at six one zero six three five nine zero nine two, and uh, I. And my team will do the best that we can to awesome. get you the help that you need. Fucking call, man. It's not that big of a deal. If you need it. If you don't, carry on. How about that? All right. Thank you, brother. Love you, boys. Thanks, man. Yeah, Appreciate man. it. Thank you. Good shit. Bam.